It's all about him, is it not? Amen. It's all about the Lord Jesus. Thank you. And to walk with him. And to acknowledge him every moment of every day. As he goes before us. Amen? Amen. Wonderful to see Betty Jane and Peter. Great to have you back. We missed you folks. We were praying for you. Thank you. And God answered our prayers. So you're here. Josephine, it's nice to see you. I was praying for you this morning. And here God brings you here. That's uh, that's the Lord. And that's how we work. Answered prayer, amen. This morning our scripture reading will be from Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Exodus 6, 1 through 13. Let us stand as we read the word of God. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. May God bless the reading of his holy word. It's interesting how God reveals himself to us as we walk along with him. Notice in the reading that we just read, he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. In the Hebrew, that is El Shaddai, God Almighty. El is God. Shaddai in the Hebrew means mountain. And you put them together and you have the strong one, El Shaddai, the strong God. And he revealed himself in the beginning to them as the strong one. Then he says, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. You read in your Bibles, you see the word Lord there is all capitalized, and you know that that stands for God's name of Yahweh. 
Yahweh, Jehovah. He did not make himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the beginning as Jehovah, Yahweh. Yahweh is, I am the one who is. I am the one who is, and I will redeem you. And that's how he revealed himself later to the people of Israel. I will redeem you. I will bring you out. And that's what God does. God redeems us. He brings us out of the world. Just like he brought Israel out of Egypt. God is a redeeming God. A strong God. And he has the ability to pull us out from the world. If we'll give ourselves to him. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue our study. This is the title of the sermon. The Days of Daniel Part 2. The Days of Daniel Part 2. We covered a week or so ago. The recipe for disaster. We're talking about Daniel and how Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians went into Jerusalem, went into Israel, and they captured the people. They killed Jehoiakim, and they brought these people back to Babylon. We talked about the recipe for disaster. Why did this happen to the nation of Israel? There's a number of things we covered last week. Number one, disobedience. They were disobedient to the word of God. God had clearly revealed to them that as Israel, his people, when they came out of the land, they were no longer to have slaves, but they did the religious thing. And so when they went into the temple on the seventh year, they released their slaves. And then as soon as they got outside the door, they enslaved them back. They were disobedient to God. He told them as well, every seventh year, you will allow the land to rest. And in the sixth year, I will give you enough provisions to last not only the seventh year when you rest and the land rests, but also into the eighth year. And that was a miracle. <clears throat> but they did not trust and they did not believe and they worked the land so that they could have more. And so for these two reasons, first of all, disobedience. God brought judgment upon the land of Israel. We also looked at the fact that they had fallen into the idolatry. They were worshiping the gods of the nations and all other types of false gods, Baal worship, following the abominations of the nations, uh, we read in 2 Chronicles. And God persistently sent to them prophets to speak to them and to tell them but they would not listen. And so we find ourselves here in terms of the results. The results of disaster. You have the outline in your bulletin. The results of disaster. Number one, captivity. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Daniel 1, 1 through 3. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, that is Babylon, to the house of his God. His God was Marduk. And placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. They experienced captivity. Isn't this ironic? They would not allow the slaves to be freed so that that scourge of slavery would be done. 
And here they are now brought into captivity, allowed by the hand of God, and they were brought to Babylon. They lost their freedom. Can you imagine? They lost their freedom. How important is freedom? How important is the ability to do what you feel God wants you to do? And yet they lost their freedom. They lost their houses. They lost their bank accounts. They lost their IRAs. They lost their big screen TVs. They lost their properties and their cars. They lost everything. Because they were holding on to everything. They lost their freedom and now, ironically, they're held captive. Second of all, they were now themselves as a nation enslaved. Again, ironic, is it not? They would not let the slaves go, and so now they're enslaved. <laughs> Jeremiah 25, 1 through 12. The word, of, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, the word of God has come to me, the word of the Lord, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently said to you, all his servants and prophets, saying, Turn now, turn now, every one of you, from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them, or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. They were literally making these idol gods. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my word, behold, I sent for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish them from the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. Do you get a sense of what God was trying to tell the, land, the people of Israel? Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your evil deeds. Stop worshiping these idols. Let the slaves go. Obey my word and give the land rest every seventh year. They would not listen. They simply would not listen. And so here now, they themselves are not only captive, but they're also enslaved. Well, the question might be, how does one turn from such a devastating situation? Daniel gives us the answer. How does one turn from a devastating situation? The reversal from disaster. First, the recipe for disaster. Second, the results of disaster. And now the reversal from disaster. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Daniel 9, 1 through 8.
In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashuharis, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. <clears throat> then I turned my face to the Lord. Notice what Daniel does. They're in captivity now. The people are enslaved. They've lost everything. And what does Daniel do? Verse 3, I turned my face to the Lord seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel turns to God. Daniel is praying, and he's praying and pleading for mercy. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We, he says, we, not they, but we, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. But to us, open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to watch, to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O oh Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Do you hear the heart of David? Do you hear where he's coming from? He's filled with remorse. He's filled with remorse and begs for forgiveness. And that's the first ingredient to turn around a devastating situation. It's not enough to walk down an aisle. There must be remorse. Daniel is praying here. He's pleading with God. He's fasting with sackcloth and ashes. And he says, we, we have sinned as a corporate body. Remorse, the first ingredients. Second of all is repentance. Remorse is necessary, but so is repentance. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9 through 19. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice and the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity, disaster, disaster. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. David and Solomon had turned Jerusalem into a jewel. Jerusalem was to be, I, I mean, the Queen of the South came up to visit. It was so awesome. They had built the temple to God. Now it's all gone. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity, disaster, has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning 
repentance, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has already, has kept ready the calamity, the disaster it has brought us upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works and that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day. We have sinned and we have done wickedly, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts. Let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for our iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O Lord, Listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas because before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O oh my God, because your city and your people call by your name. Daniel is pleading with God. First, there's remorse. There is a deep sense of sinfulness. And he includes himself in that body. Daniel was a very righteous person. There was deep remorse. And he pleaded with God for forgiveness because we have sinned. And then he talks here about turning around. You see, that's the second necessary ingredient is to turn around. To turn around from our ways. To obey God and to turn from our ways. Ezra wrote to these people. And let me read you what he said. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God calls us not to seek for liberty, not to seek for freedom from enslavement, not to seek any of those things. The primary thing that God says here for us to seek is His face. To seek Him, to seek His face, to come before Him on a daily basis. We sang the song, beautiful song, close to walk with Thee, Lord. To walk with Jesus, to walk with God, moment by moment by moment. Asking God to cleanse us from our sin. Asking God to make us more like Jesus Christ. And that's God's desire from the very beginning. Here, Jerusalem and the Israelites have been taken captive. And they lost their freedom because they disobeyed. They wouldn't hear. But God says, if my people, if my people will humble themselves. And that's difficult for us, is it not? We live in a society, in a country that is built on pride. Look at me. Look at me. Look at all I have. Look at what I possess. God says, no. God says, seek my face, and I will heal the land. Ladies and gentlemen, we all understand and know where we as a nation are today, do we not? We're all very aware of what's going on. And yet God says, if we 
Those who belong to him will seek his face, humble ourselves, be remorseful, be repentant, turn to him, he will heal our land. That's God's desire. Now that might not be what happens because again, I believe we're in the end times. I believe we're in a place as the world where Christ is coming again. And so we continue our study in Daniel. Next week we'll look at Daniel personally and we'll look at his friends and see what type of people they were. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we understand what the recipe for disaster is disobedience and idolatry. I pray for our nation. I pray for this country where there are millions and millions of your children who are praying, Lord, the recipe is disobedience and idolatry and we see it all around. The results Captivity, O oh Lord, and enslavement. And so much of our nation is enslaved. Enslaved to those things that are dishonoring to you. And yet, you give us an opportunity as a nation to reverse call that we should be remorseful, that we should feel sorry for our sins. I pray that the world and the nation would do that and then turn, turn from their evil ways and the wicked ways and turn to you, Lord God, and seek your face and then you will heal our land. Thank you, Father, for being a loving God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the redemption that we have in Jehovah, the Lord. You have brought us out. You have taken us from Egypt and set us free. Lord Jesus, give us the strength that we need in these days to press on as we talked at the beginning of the year, a new beginning to press on that we might be more and more like you and that we might love you more and more. Thank you, Father, for your word. Impress it upon our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn to our closing hymn. 139. Great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful. God is faithful. And he honors his word. Let us stand and sing. 139.
Jesus Christ, may he fill you to fullness with his Holy Spirit. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.